This thing is a tax-free cash cow. This is buy term invest the difference on steroids. The insurance industry would be the last domino to fall if things got really bad. People go, wow, how come I've never heard of this before? When you're looking at strategies that was really became very popular in the 70s and 80s, which was buy term yep. and invest the difference, which still today is still an ongoing argument with all the information and education still out there, still arguing that this financial concept is still a solvent strategy. I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there just unaware of the other side. So what would you say to those critics of the buy term and invest the difference? I ended up... Uh being responsible for over 3,000 clients in 13 Western states. And, you know, we were trying to do a good job uh, selling them term insurance and putting the difference into uh, mutual funds. And, and it was a sort of like a forced investment because a lot of people don't even invest the difference. Okay. Spend it, yep. And uh, the whole theory was, uh, if you listen to the Dave Ramseys and the Susie Ormans, well, when you accumulate uh, enough, uh, at the end of the day, you won't need insurance anymore when it gets expensive. Mm -hmm. When Universal Life came out in 1980, E.F. Hutton was the brainchild of that, okay? They weren't in an insurance company. And they were the ones who said, wait a minute, <clears throat> we're out here. Did you ever play red light, green light when you were a kid? Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> the stock market, we had money in, in, in mutual funds. And it was like playing red light, green light. So there were some periods where you might uh, take 20 steps forward. You get 20% return, but then the next year you have to take you know, 10 or 15 steps back, up and back, up and back. The stock market is like a person with a yo-yo, maybe hopefully walking up some stairs, let's say. Well, <clears throat> when Hutton realized the average rate of return, even if you earned 12%, let's say you finally accumulate a million dollars in a retirement nest egg and you're only 12%. That's 120 grand a year. You pull out 120,000, uh, you're taking 12 steps forward, you're taking four steps back in tax between federal and state tax. You take another step back in fees because they're charging 1% on that million. You're netting seven, even though you're grossing 12. Do you know what most people actually earn with their money in the market because they get invo involved in emotion? They, <clears throat> they watch like in 2001 to 2003, they watch the market go down, 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 down. And they finally say enough already and they sell. They sell low and then they wait, 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 wait and they buy high. So Dalbar, who studies investor behavior, says the average, especially retiree, only is earning 3.5%. This is what precipitated the 4% rule in the financial services industry. So they're not earning 12. You got a million bucks, you pull out 4%, uh, that's 40 grand. You pay tax in a 25% bracket of 10,000. Now you're netting 30. Now, what, what about the 1% fee on that? That's another 10 grand. Y you're living off of 2% or 3%. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't accumulate a million bucks to have a measly 20 or 30,000 net to buy gas, groceries, prescriptions, and golf green fees. That's pretty pathetic. With my index universal life, I was able to uh, participate in the market without the risk. When the market went up, I'm able to earn. When it goes down, I don't lose because of indexing. So in answer to your question, <clears throat> by having my money there, I'm able to earn average returns. Uh, conservatively, I've earned 8.2% net cash on cash. So a million dollar nest egg can generate 80,000 a year of tax-free income. Whereas most IRAs and 401ks, you're gonna be lucky in the market to net, uh, to, to earn four and net three or two because of the taxes. And so <clears throat> when Hutton came out with it, I went, this is by term invest the difference on steroids. People don't invest the difference. If I maximum fund it, my cash value pretty soon uh, equals the death benefit and pushes it ahead. So the cost of the insurance, hear this, gets cheaper as you get older. <laughs> and people go, what? I've never seen an insurance policy that gets cheaper as I get older. Well, you haven't seen one done correctly then. Because my universal life policies that are 30 years old cost less than 1 20th what they did when I was 30 years younger. Because cost of insurance per thousand goes up, but the amount of insurance that's at risk with the insurance company is going down. If I earned 10% this year, I would net 10 point, I, I, would, earn, I would net 9.9 .9 because mm -hmm. the cost of the insurance has gotten cheaper as I've gotten older because I'm self-insuring. Yep. So this whole argument of Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, oh, 20, 30 years from now, you won't, um, you won't need the term insurance when it gets expensive because you'll have the money. 
Well, universal life, you have the money. Sometimes as soon as 15 years and you're self-insured. I'm using it for living benefits and when I die it will blossom and transfer tax-free. But when uh, Hutton came out with that, oh, let's take the least amount of insurance we can get away with in the Internal Revenue Code and put in the most money. And pretty soon you are self-insuring in as little as 15 years. You put in 500,000, the minimum death benefit for a 60 year old is a million two fifty. Your 500,000 is going to exceed a million two fifty in less than 15 years of the growth. So it's like, and now when the cash value grows to 2 million, the death benefit stays ahead by 5%. The insurance company is only charging you for the remaining amount, 100,000 at risk. This thing is a tax free cash cow. And people uh, get hung up on what it is instead of what it does. Ooh, key point. But Doug, you know, the big misconception, people say, well, well, term insurance is only 50 bucks. Why is my eviction versus life premium so expensive at 500 bucks? Because people don't think that, you know, the annual renewable term inside the, the, the $500 premium, it's not all going to life insurance. And oh. can, can, you, can, you, can you unpack that further? Yes, because <clears throat> before universal life came about, there was term and whole life. Whole life insurance allowed you to pay a higher premium to where you were um, overpaying the early years. And then later on at age 45, 50, you were starting to underpay. Uh, so you could be covered for your whole life. Now whole life is okay for death benefit. When they developed universal life, it was primarily for living benefits. So even though you put in $500, people that would come to me wanted to increase the liquidity on their money that was earmarked for retirement, for college funding, for their kids and so forth. Uh, they wanted to increase the safety, not only of where their money is, the institution, but safety of principle. So that when the market went down, they didn't lose. And they wanted to have a nice rate of return that historically has beaten inflation. You can't be rowing upstream at the rate of one mile an hour in a bank and the current of inflation is coming down to three or four. You're going backwards. And so <clears throat> people would say, Doug, where can I put my money that's earmarked for retirement, uh, my kid's college education, emergency funds, and I'm going, well, let me show you this Swiss Army knife, okay? Now, you put your money in here and you go, wait a minute, that's $500 a month. Well, how much are you putting in the company's 401k? What if I could show you this will knock the socks off of that? What about this money you have sitting in the bank earning a measly 1%? If you could increase the safety and the rate of return up to 5%, how much more is five than one? It's five times. And all of a sudden they go, yeah, it makes sense. And then I would create an illustration. Mm -hmm. I'd say, here we go. The first few years they may look at it and go, well, uh, there's some fees in there. Look at what it does at the back end. And so I'd show them the back end at age 60 or 65. And then we start taking out income. And I would compare to their 401k and it would crash and burn in 11 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, money and, and municipal bonds would crash and burn, mutual funds, even if we anticipated 12%, because they're taxable. All of these are running out of money, and I go, look at this one over on the far right. Uh, it, it, it will last if you live to be 120, and you still have your million bucks or whatever. And they'd go, whoa, and I'd say, which one would you like? Uh, the one on the right, duh. And then I would say, um, <clears throat> Well, do you know what that is? And they'd say, what is that? I said, it's a life insurance policy. <laughs> and sometimes they'd go, wait a minute. Oh, I don't need insurance. I go, really? Okay. Look at what it does. Which one knocks the others completely, blows it out of the water? Well, the one on the right, but we don't need insurance. I don't want to pay for insurance. I'm going, who's paying? It's, it's not costing. It's making you money. Um, Okay, if you don't really want the insurance, make me the beneficiary then. <laughs> but, but choose the one that's going to accumulate your money the best, tax-free, and, and generate the most income. And when you die, it, it blossoms and transfers. And finally, they would get it and say, oh, you mean that's net? I'm going, yeah, that's the net. Everything that you're looking at there it's is cool. after the cost of the insurance, which is now this. Over the life of it, if you, if you earn nine, you'll net eight. If you earn seven, you'll net six. If you earn 11, you'll, you'll net 10. I've been doing that for 45 years. And people go, wow, how come I've never heard of this before? Well, uh, I've heard, heard of it for 45 years, but don't 
follow the herd, putting money in IRAs of 401ks. Best advice I've ever heard, don't follow the herd and don't listen to the mainstream media because they're part of the herd. You need to break away and um, take ownership of a brighter future by learning uh, the merits of a max funded indexed universal life. I did a YouTube recently uh, why uh, multimillionaires, wealthy people are buying more life insurance than ever. They have the money. Yeah. It's because they want their money in an instrument that will accumulate tax-free. They can access, access it tax-free. When they die, it blossoms and transfers tax-free. Nothing else does that. Yeah. Uh, and often we've referred to you know, Walt Disney. He saved Disneyland uh, by using access cash-free uh, to the cash values out of his insurance policy. J.C. Penney did it. Ray Kroc uh, McDonald's did it. Uh, David uh, Walker is the comptroller of the, of the um, uh, General Accountability Office. When he left the Obama administration, he said, I'll tell you where to put your money in max-funded universal life. Wow. Because he saw how critical the country was. We came so close to a financial collapse yep. in 2008, and he said to America, this is where I put my money. Why is that? Is it because of the reserves, the, the promise to pay the reserves, behind the reserves? You know, the, the whole conversation, too, because, you know, in the collapse, not one A-rated insurance company failed. You find out these real estate companies failed, banks failed, mortgage companies failed. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that uh, the insurance industry, legal reserve insurance industry, is not only the backbone of America, but the backbone of the world. This is, <clears throat> again, if you were to look at uh, banks, in 2008, 400 banks went under, 900 more were on the brink on the watch list. Mm -hmm. And not one legal reserve insurance company went under. If they had a little bit of a, a, a run on the bank thing like AIG did because of the mortgages and so forth, it was, uh, they were able to, uh, they couldn't call all their mortgages due instantly. But there's always in the, um, the legal reserve insurance industry, uh, you cross insure, which is way better than an FDIC. FDIC technically went broke when they bailed out the savings and loans. So one insurance company uh, not only manages billions, one I'm thinking about uh, manages about $3 trillion. That's as much money as the IRS collects in taxes in an entire year. One insurance company, and they manage that much money, maybe with one skyscraper full of employees. You know how many federal employees uh, spend, you know, it takes to manage you know, three or four trillion that the IRS brings in. So <clears throat> this is how I look at it, Matt. When people say, why do you put your serious cash there? It's because, in my opinion, the insurance industry would be the last domino to fall if things got really bad. Okay? You'd have so much forewarning because the banks would be uh, uh, collapsing. Uh, in the Great Depression, 80%, uh, real estate dropped 80%, a lot of real estate. Banks went under, 40% never uh, reopened again. Not one legal reserve insurance company went under the Great Depression. They came through with flying colors, crediting 25 3 3.5%. So we would have so much warning if that if the economy is ready to collapse, that you could take out your money out of the insurance policy because it's so liquid. Uh, this is where banks put 30 to 40% of their tier one assets for liquidity and safety because they asked the five major banks in America in 2008, where do you have your money <laughs> for liquidity and safety in case of a run on your bank? Guess where they had it? 30 to 40% was in Boley. Bank owned life insurance. See, it's the owner of the insurance policy that gets all the tax free accumulation of that. But let's say it got really bad and you got your money out of your insurance policy. If the American dollar became worthless, what good would it do to have your money? See, the last domino to fall would be the insurance industry. Uh, you can't buy, uh, live on gold and silver. You can't eat that. Mm -mm. So I choose to put my serious cash in the last domino that would fall. And if that failed, the American dollar would be worthless anyway. But you want it in a, in, a, in a position of safety and liquidity so that you can convert it to gas and groceries or food or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is there's things in life even more important than the money. But that's why so many institutions will choose to put your money in a bank into an insurance company because they're rock solid as far as their uh, liquid reserves. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah.